Okay, page two of the differentiation addendum. Um, first, we're going to start out looking at this uh, interesting function here, sine theta divided by theta. Um, when you look at this, you think, oh my gosh, if I put theta equals zero, I am going to have zero in the denominator of a fraction, which is illegal, right? Um, it turns out that um, in this case, not only would you have zero in the denominator, but if you put uh, zero into theta in the numerator, you would have sine of zero. Remember that sine of zero is zero, and you would actually have zero divided by zero. And we're going to find out later at the end of the course that zero divided by zero uh, might be an invalid value or it might not. And it kind of depends on how similar the zero is on top with the zero on the bottom. And we're not going to know how to do that um, rigorously until um, the end of the course. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the theory behind that. We're just going to maybe look at if you graph this on the calculator, it looks like this. So basically, you can see that uh, when x equals 0, when theta equals 0, the height of the function is indeed 1. So uh, just by graphing it, by putting these numbers in the calculator, you can see that uh, the value at x equals 0 is y equals 1. Okay? So the value as theta approaches 0 of this function is 1. We'll put that here. Okay. Uh, now, now that we know this, and if you look at the investigation, there's a couple other uh, ways um, that uh, you can kind of convince yourself that this is true without having to do a proof. And on page 516, they actually have the proof. But you don't need to study the proof now because you're going to learn more of the math behind the proof at the end of the course. Okay? So, um, as you can see in example 6 in the book, once you know that sine of theta divided by theta is 1, when theta approaches 0, you can uh, figure out um, what similar expressions that look like this are when theta approaches 0. So let's do that. Like, look at this one here, 1a. The limit as theta approaches 0 of sine of 2 theta divided by theta. Uh, now, this looks eerily like this, right? Except there's a difference. There's a 2 theta here. Right, And if you looked in example 6, you'll see that the trick to doing this is to kind of like match what's in the sign uh, argument with what's in the bottom. And you can see that they don't match. One is 2 theta and the other is theta. So what we can do here uh, as, a, uh, as kind of a, a trick is we could put a 2 down here as long as we put a 2 up here too. Right? If I put a 2 on top and I put a 2 on the bottom... That's not really changing the expression because I'm multiplying basically by 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So now I can circle the 2 theta on the bottom. And now you see that we do have uh, a match. We have a match between the argument for sine and the denominator. The only thing that's extra is the 2 that we ended up putting out front, which is kind of left over. So we could say that uh, sine of 2 theta divided by 2 theta is similar to the expression sine of theta divided by theta, right? The only difference is instead of theta, we have 2 theta. But since they're proportional, they're, or they're basically the same variable, I could replace 2 theta with something else like u. And if I replace both 2 thetas with u, then I have sine of u divided by u. Sine of u divided by u is the same thing as sine of theta divided by theta. It's just a different name for the variable. So the green part is going to become uh, as theta approaches 0, it's going to become 1, right? So that means we'll have the, the 2, which is out front, and the green part is going to become 1. So basically, we're going to have 2 times 1, which is 2, right? So the limit of this expression, which looks a lot like this expression, except there's an extra 2 in it, happens to be 2 instead of 1. Okay, let's look at C. Now, we have tangent of theta by theta, which kind of looks like sine of theta divided by theta, except tangent is not sine, right? But what do we do know about tangent, which relates it to sine? Well, remember from your um, trig chapters, tangent of theta is actually equal to the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta. 
So what if I do that substitution here? Will I be closer to making this equal to sine of theta divided by theta? And I will, because if I do that substitution, if I replace tangent of theta with sine of theta divided by cosine of theta, do you see how I end up with um, sine of theta divided by theta divided by cosine of theta? So now I could say, okay, well now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the part that matches sine of theta divided by theta, that there I've highlighted in green, and then I just have cosine of theta left over, and so I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to say the limit as theta approaches zero of sine of theta divided by theta is actually one, right? It's going to become one when we apply the limit to it. And the cosine theta is in the denominator, right? So we'll put that here. And then you might think, oh my gosh, now we got another problem. What in the world is the limit of 1 over cosine theta? But that one is not so bad, because if you remember, the value of cosine of 0 is 1, right? So if we substitute in theta equals 0 now, the uh, this part here, 1 over cosine theta, just becomes 1 divided by 1, which is just 1. So in the end, this is also equal to 1. Okay, so now uh, 1e. So again, I see a similarity between uh, the top and the bottom combined here. If I combine these two, it kind of looks like sine of theta divided by theta. If only the bottom was uh, h over 2 instead of just h. So I'm going to multiply the bottom by 1 half, which means I need to multiply the top by 1 half also. And then now I have um, the same thing on the denominator as I do as the argument for sine. So I can change the green part into 1 when I take the limit, right? So now I'm going to have the uh, the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 half times 1 times the cosine of h. And this isn't too bad because if I put h into cosine, uh, if I put h equals 0 into cosine, I'm going to get cosine of 0, which is 1. So the answer to this one is 1 half. Okay, now let's go down to 3a. Uh, show that the cosine of a plus b minus the cosine of a minus b equals negative 2 sine a sine b. Okay, so this we can, uh, we've probably already derived this back in the trig identities chapter, but uh, we doesn't hurt to do it again, right? So, I'm going to take the left side which is cosine of two angles added together minus the cosine of two angles subtracted from each other. And, and I'm going to look at the formula sheet to see what that is equal to. So that's the first step. I'm going to look at cosine a plus b, and then I compare it to this trig identity here. Cosine of a plus b is equal to the cosine of a cosine b minus the sine of a sine b. And so I wrote that right here. Then I put a minus sign right there. And then I take cosine of a minus b, and I look at this again, and now I'm going to look at the bottom signs here. So the cosine of a minus b is equal to the cosine of a cosine b plus sine a sine b. And then I write that inside the parentheses, and they're separated with a minus sign, right? Now I'm going to combine like terms. So do you see how cosine a cosine b minus cosine a cosine b, these two um, terms eliminate each other? And then, so what I'm left with is minus sine a sine b minus sine a sine b. So basically I have um, minus 2 sine a sine b. And that's exactly what we were supposed to end up with. So it's perfect, right? Okay. Then b says, suppose a plus b is s and a minus b is d. Show that cosine of s minus cosine d is equal to this. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to replace uh, a plus b with s and a minus b with d. So the left side is going to look like... So I've replaced a plus b with s, so it's cosine of s, minus... 
And now I've replaced A minus B with cosine D. And that is the left side, right? I've simplified the left side. Now, in order to do the right side, I'm going to need expressions for A and B in terms of S and D. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the two uh, relationships they gave me, and then I'm going to combine them with algebra until I get an expression with S on the left side and A plus A and B on the right side, and the same thing for D. So you can see that if I line them up, if I just do, if I add them together, it will eliminate the Bs, and then I'll have A by itself on the left side and S and D on the right side, and I've not eliminated B. So let me do that. So I'm going to combine these two. Oops. I'm going to combine these two together, and I'll end up with 2A on the left, because the A gets doubled, plus B and minus B cancel each other out, and on the right side I have S plus D. And uh, now I divide both sides by 2, so I'll have A on the left side, and on the right side I'll have S plus D on the right side. And so that's the uh, what we're going to replace A with, S plus D divided by 2. Now let's figure out what we're going to do with B. Uh, so we know that uh, A plus B equals S. So if we do, um, if we replace A with S plus D divided by 2, then we can kind of figure out what B is equal to if we subtract uh, S plus D divided by 2 to the left, to the right side. So we're going to subtract both sides by S plus D divided by 2, and so we'll have B on the left, and on the right side we'll have S minus S plus D divided by 2. So that's equal to um, S divided by 2 minus D divided by 2, which would be S minus D divided by 2. So that's what we have for an expression that we could put in for B. And now you can see that we're pretty much done, because now if we replace uh, this S plus D divided by 2 in for A, and we replace S minus D divided by 2 in for B, then we're going to get exactly what we want, which is minus 2 sine S plus D divided by 2 times sine of s minus d divided by 2. Okay, so that was part b. Finally, part c. Hence, find that the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x plus h minus cosine x divided by h. Find the, find the, basically what they're saying is find the derivative of cosine. Okay, so our first step is we're going to rewrite the expression that they gave us, and then uh, we're going to go back and look at the relationships they gave us to see if there's uh, something similar here. And even though we don't know what we're going to end up with, they gave us this huge clue with part A and part B, so we know that we're supposed to use that to substitute in and change the way this looks. So I can see that I have cosine something minus cosine something. That matches with this expression here. It also matches with this expression here. Now, if I say that x plus h is s, and I say that x is d, then do you see that how it matches exactly here? And then I could take the x plus h and substitute it every time I see s on the right side, and I could substitute x for d every time I see it on the, on, on the right side also. So why don't I do that? I'm going to write this left side, except for in, instead of putting s and d, I'm going to put x plus h and x. Okay? So I'm going to do that. Okay, so I just did that. I took the right side, which is minus 2 sine blah blah blah, sine blah blah blah, and I replaced, replaced the s plus d with x plus h plus x. I replaced s minus d with x plus h minus x. Now I'm going to simplify the red part on the right side, okay? So uh, I have neglected also to include the bottom, the denominator of this whole thing every time, right? So I have h in the bottom here, I have h in the bottom here, and I have h in the bottom here, okay? And now is when we're going to use our secret um, weapon, which is that uh, we know this is true, okay? Um, so let's go back and do that. Um, so is there anything that kind of looks like that? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. This kind of looks like what we just saw up there, right? 
So how about if we try to make the bottom look like this? How do we, we're going to try to make the bottom look like h divided by 2. So the way we do that is we multiply the bottom by 1 half. But if we multiply the bottom by 1 half, we're going to have to also multiply by the top by 1 half, right? And I'll do this in a different color just so that we don't get confused here. So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 1 half, which is the same thing as multiplying it by 1. So we haven't changed the... Um, the, the value of the expression. And when we multiply the bottom by um, 1 half, then you see that h times 1 half is actually equal to the inside of sine of h over 2. It's the same, right? So now we know that the highlighted green part becomes 1 when we take the limit as, uh, as, as uh, h approaches 0, we know that the green part is going to become 1. So that's what we're going to do. So once the green part becomes 1, then we can just simplify the rest of it. Do you see how the negative 2 here multiplies times by 1 half here, and then you just end up with negative 1? So we end up with negative sine x plus h over 2 uh, limit as h approaches 0. And if we put in uh, 0 in for h, then we're just going to get sine of x plus 0, which is equal to sine, uh, negative sine of x. Right? Negative sine of x, and h over 2 became 0. So the derivative of cosine x is equal to negative sine of x, just like uh, we're going to find out in later chapters. Okay? So in the next section, uh, we are going to find the derivative of 4 over x using first principles. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to substitute f of x plus h minus f of x with 4 over the expression x plus h minus 4 over x. And the bottom is going to be h, just like the definition of uh, the first principles derivative is. And so now we're just going to use algebra to try to combine these together and see if we can simplify this, okay? Now, what's the problem right now if I put in, if I substitute h equals 0 in for here? So I would get 0 in the denominator, and then I would get uh, undefined quantity. So I don't want to do that. Somehow I want to get h out of the denominator. So let's first try to combine these together using algebra. So what I decided to do was... Uh, I'm going to combine these two terms, and the only way I can combine them is by using a common denominator. So if I want to make the common denominator x plus h times x, then I multiply this term by x divided by x, and I multiply this term by x plus h divided by x plus h. So that's what I did here. And now I'm going to expand the denominator, and I'm going to expand the numerators and subtract them. Okay, so do you see how the denominator is here? And then I took the 4x and I put it here. And then the minus 4 times x plus h becomes minus 4x minus 4h. So now I can see that the 4x minus 4x, these cancel each other out. So then I'm just left with minus 4h divided by this big mess in the bottom. So let me write that. Minus 4h on top. And then I'm going to have x times x plus h here, and then uh, h in the bottom. If I have something divided by something divided by something, then I can put the two denominators together in the same denominator, okay? Because uh, when I divide by this, it's like, okay, I'm going to invert and multiply, so I'm going to multiply times 1 divided by h, okay? So I get four, negative 4h four on top, and I have this on the bottom. Do you see how the h's now cancel out? So I'm left with the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 4 on top and x divided by x plus h on the bottom. And when I substitute an h equals 0, I end up with negative 4 divided by x squared. Okay, now I'm going to use the first principles formula to find the gradient of the tangent to this function at x equals 3. Since I'm finding it at x equals 3, it's a little bit easier because now instead of writing x plus h um, for the first term and in the first term and x in the second term, now I can just put in a number, 3. So it, it makes it a little bit easier. Let me show you what I mean. So uh, I'm not going to write the limit because that's kind of like 
extra writing, which uh, I don't have to write it every time. So I'm just going to write the expression, okay? So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an expression which is equivalent to the definition of first principles without the limit, okay? And I'm going to use for the function this expression here, and every time I see x, I'm going to substitute in 3. So instead of 1 over x plus h squared, I'm going to have 1 over 3 plus h squared, right? And then I'm going to subtract f of x, which actually I'm going to put in f of 3 instead, okay? So I'm going to put f of 3 is 1 over 3 squared, okay? And then I'm going to divide that by h, right? Because that's the denominator here. Okay, now I'm going to try to uh, simplify this to the point where I don't have h in the, num in the denominator anymore, because if I have h in the denominator, when I do the limit as h approaches 0, the denominator becomes 0, and it's an invalid value. So I need to cancel out the h with something, and I can only do that probably if I simplify the numerator or combine the like terms in the numerator. So let's do the same thing we did before. We're going to find a common denominator, which would be 9 times 3 plus h squared. So we're going to have that for the uh, first expression, so it'll be 9 over 9, uh, 3 plus h squared, because to find the common denominator, we had to multiply both the top and the bottom by 9. Then the second term, we're going to do kind of something similar, except now we're going to multiply both the top and the bottom by 3 plus h squared, okay? All right. Now, and the, remember the bottom continues to be h, okay? Now we are going to combine uh, the two terms on top. So we're going to end up with 9 minus 3 plus h squared divided by the denominator, which is 9 divided by 3 plus h squared, and then divided by h, which is the second denominator. Uh, now let's expand the top. So the top is going to be 9 minus, and then we're going to do FOIL, so we'll have 9 plus 6h plus h squared, and then on the bottom we have what we had before. I'm, I'm just going to put ditto marks. And then now do you see how the top, the 9s cancel out? So that means I end up with minus 6h minus h squared, right? And then uh, I can factor out an h out of both of those, so it'll become h factored out, and then inside I'll have negative 6h minus h, right? And do you see how the top h cancels out with the bottom h? Because this ditto mark was actually 9h times 3 plus h squared, so the h's cancel out, and that's how I actually got rid of the h, and then I'm end up, I end up with just this expression here. So now I rewrite the expression with the limit as h approaches 0, the top is negative 6 minus h, and the bottom has uh, 9 times 3 plus h squared. If I take the h as a substitute at 0, now I no longer have a problem because the denominator doesn't become 0. And on the top, I'm going to have negative 6. And the bottom, I'm going to have 9 times 3 plus h is uh, 3 plus 0, which is 3 squared. So it's 9 times 9, which is 81 on the bottom. So my answer is negative 6 divided by 81. Okay, now let's move on to, to c. C wants me to find the derivative of square root of x at x equals 4 using first principles. So first I'm going to take the definition of um, the derivative using first principles. I didn't write the limit here because just to save space. And uh, so the first uh, term becomes square root of x plus h, and the second term is square root of x. But instead of x, we want to evaluate it at x equals 4, so I'm just going to go ahead and put in x equals 4. And you can see why we're doing that, because if it was just x, it would, this would be a much harder problem. So let's replace the x's with uh, 4's, and we end up with this. And now we can see that, like, for example, the second term, it just becomes 2. Now... We're going to do a trick here, and I'm not expecting you to know how to do this, but we, this is a trick that is often used for integrals also. So as you work through this course, you're going to get more and more used to this trick, and maybe um, you'll get to the point where it's like uh, you'll know when to use this trick, and it makes things easier for you. Now, uh, for example, one of the problems we have here is that these square root signs, we're never going to be able to combine these like terms, right? Uh, now, it would be easier if this uh, was just one variable and not 4 plus h here. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a substitution. 
And instead of 4 plus h, I'm going to substitute another variable called u. And do you see how u equals 4 plus h? And I can rearrange it so that h equals u minus 4, right? So normally we do the limit as h approaches 0. Instead of doing that, we're going to do the limit as u approaches 4. Because if I put 0 here, it'll be 4 plus 0. So u is going to approach um, 4, right? So I'm going to rewrite this limit as the limit as u approaches 4. And all the um, expressions that have h's, I'm going to replace them with u. So do you see how 4 plus square? 4 plus h in the radical sign becomes square root of u. Uh, square root of 4 becomes minus 2. And then the denominator, instead of h, I'm going to put u minus 4. Okay, now this is uh, looks like an incredible coincidence, but you know book problems are incredible coincidences. Okay, so if I have u minus 4 on the bottom and I have square root of u, square root of u minus 2 on top, you might recognize this as a squared minus b squared uh, factoring. So like the bottom, let's say, is a squared minus b squared. So if this is a squared minus b squared, that means a equals square root of u and b equals 2. And what do you know? That's what I have on top. So I'm going to factor the bottom as a limit here. And the bottom I'm going to factor into a, a minus b times a plus b. So I'm going to have square root of u minus 2 times the square root of u plus 2. And do you see how, how nicely that cancels out with the top? So now I can cancel out this with this. And then I would end up with the limit as uh, u approaches 4 of 1 over the square root of u plus 2. And now if I plug in u equals 4 in this expression, I'm just going to get 1 over square root of 4 plus 2, which is 1 over 2 plus 2, which is 1 over 4.